Thank you for joining us for part two of my three-part series on hepatic steatosis. In this screencast, we'll discuss the patterns of steatosis. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to identify the different common patterns of steatosis, which we have listed here. Diffuse steatosis is one of the most common forms of steatosis that we see, but we can even see a person with diffuse steatosis develop changes that make that steatosis look inhomogeneous or heterogeneous. So here we have a 33-year-old woman with a history of alcohol abuse who had mild steatosis. So we can see some mild steatosis, decreased density of the liver relative to the spleen. That mild steatosis worsens quite dramatically. So in one month's time, the patient presents with acute hepatitis due to heavy alcohol use. And we can see that diffuse steatosis has now progressed to a very heterogeneous form of steatosis, where within the background of diffuse steatosis, you now have geographic fat deposition and, and probably superimposed inflammation and fibrosis. So you can see that that mild diffuse steatosis with continued alcohol use can progress very rapidly to a more severe form of steatosis and, and likely underlying fibrosis. When we think about diffuse steatosis, most commonly we think of it as, as, a, as a really homogenous process, but again, we can see a sort of multifocal or heterogeneous appearance. So here on contrast enhanced CT, we see these nodular areas of low attenuation in a background of a heterogeneously low attenuating liver. So the liver overall is decreased relative to the spleen, but we have even more focal areas of hypodensity in the hepatic parenchyma. When we look at this same patient on MRI, we're gonna see there is some diffuse steatosis, but in addition, we have these nodular, kind of irregular, patchy areas of more severe steatosis superimposed on that background of diffuse steatosis. Steatosis can also be a transient phenomenon. So I've seen this a number of times where a patient will present to the emergency department acutely intoxicated, often in the setting of trauma. They will be admitted for a number of days. They will get a repeat scan and you'll see resolution of their steatosis. So here we can see an initial non-contrast CT in the setting of trauma for a patient who is acutely intoxicated. We can see that the liver is severely hypoattenuating relative to the spleen. And then a follow-up CT six days later showed normalization of the hepatic parenchyma. So the patient had been admitted, had been in the hospital for six days, had not had any alcohol, and that steatosis resolved. So it can resolve or be transient, um, which was uh, relatively surprising to me when I first learned that. And it is thought that um, prolonged fasting, which results in a ketogenic state, can cause acute steatosis. Um, you can have one or multiple extremely fatty meals. So think of a, a supersized meal or supersized McDonald's meal, and then severe alcohol intoxication. Drug-induced steatohepatitis is most commonly seen in patients who are undergoing chemotherapy. I would say that I see it most commonly in the gynecologic oncology and breast cancer population. In this case, we see a woman, 53, granulosis cell tumor, started on tamoxifen, and we can watch as the liver in July of 2015 progresses to severe steatosis over the course of about 13 months. It's not really clear um, what the mechanism is for drug-induced steatosis, meaning each, each drug is, is different. Um, tamoxifen is felt to cause this steatosis without inflammation, 
where other drugs such as arenotecan, which can be used with GI tumors, um, is felt to impact liver function and can increase morbidity. So it is important to, uh, you know, talk about this in patients who uh, are undergoing chemotherapy so that the referring clinician knows that there are changes to the liver, especially if there may be some liver-directed liver therapy, such as a resection of oligometastatic disease in colorectal cancer. When we think about the more focal or non-diffuse patterns of steatosis, one of the ways we can recognize this form of steatosis is based on some really characteristic or classic locations. And that is due to a third inflow phenomenon. So while we think of the liver having dual blood supply, 80% of the oxygenation coming from the portal vein, 20% coming from the hepatic artery, there's also a third form of inflow that are small local draining veins that are draining perihepatic structures. So the perimbilical veins drain the falciform ligament and a little bit of that anterior abdominal wall. The cholecystic veins drain the gallbladder and the peribiliary veins drain the walls of the biliary tree. And each of these veins drains blood from that structure into the liver and almost substitutes locally for the portal venous blood flow. That local third inflow is not going to have the same metabolic factors that portal vein blood will have. So both the gut and the pancreas are excreting proteins, amino acids, and, and various metabolic factors into the blood. That portal vein blood is then having an impact on hepatocyte function and altering local metabolism. Well, because the areas that are getting predominantly third inflow and not portal flow aren't going to see those same metabolically active factors and those that same ingested lipid and amino acids and carbohydrates, they are not going to respond in the same way. So their metabolism will be altered, and that can result in either focal fat, which we most commonly see along the falciform ligament due to perimbilical veins, or it can be due to focal fatty sparing, <clears throat> which we are most commonly going to see along the gallbladder fossa related to the cholecystic veins. So let's look at a few extreme examples of that. Here we had a 36-year-old man with alcohol abuse and abdominal pain presenting on ultrasound with these two sort of heterogeneous, well-defined masses along the gallbladder fossa. This was very worrisome for neoplasm. The patient underwent a CT, and we see these two masses, well-defined. They do have some local mass effect on the gallbladder, um, and they're low in attenuation. While there are some neoplasms that may have diffuse fat in them, they're relatively rare. And, and we went to MRI and we found that these were just areas of focal fat deposition along the gallbladder fossa, a nodular steatosis. And I will say that in general, focal fat should not have mass effect and the vessel should pass through the focal fat, but there are unfortunately exceptions to almost every rule. This is a person who has diffuse hepatic steatosis. <clears throat> they were being evaluated for abdominal pain and elevated transaminases. We can see their liver is diffusely echogenic. We've loss of periportal fat. And then along the gallbladder fossa, we have this non-circular region of hypoechogenicity. This non-circular region of hypoechogenicity in the setting of diffuse steatosis, especially when it butts right up against the gallbladder, is classic for focal fatty sparing. Oftentimes you do not need to do additional imaging in these patients unless the patient has risk factors for metastatic disease or primary hepatic neoplasm. And in that case, an MRI or CT could be obtained to increase your confidence that it's focal fat. This same patient did receive a CT. I would recommend an MRI if you're trying to confirm focal fat. But on this CT, we can see diffuse low attenuation of the liver with this geographic area that is non-circular of 
hyperattenuation that corresponds to their focal fatty sparing. This is a patient with uncontrolled diabetes and hyperlipidemia who presented to CT and we can see multiple geographic areas of low attenuation and this this area right is going to be sort of near where the gallbladder fossa is going to be and also a little bit anterior to that right portal vein here we're along the falciform ligament and this is a more atypical location often segment too you can see that these areas are very well defined with signal loss on our opposed phase imaging compared to our in phased imaging and these are likely related to some para umbilical veins and peribiliary venous drainage or third inflow in this patient with hyperlipidemia and diabetes. In conclusion, diffuse hepatic steatosis can result from multiple different etiologies as varied as alcohol use, diabetes, or drug toxicity. And it can be quite heterogeneous, which makes it a little more challenging to diagnose and differentiate, particularly from fibrosis or cirrhosis, or it can be very homogeneous. Non-diffuse steatosis tends to present in these classic locations related to third inflow. And when you see them in those classic locations, it can increase your confidence that something is, is steatosis or fatty sparing. Nodular forms of steatosis can mimic me neoplasms. We'll talk a little bit more about mimics in part three. Typically, steatosis will not have local mass effect and will not alter the course or caliber of a vessel. Geographic fatty sparing and focal fat also tend to be non-circular. So most commonly, they're non-circular. They're sort of either wedge-shaped or geographic, and they occur in these typical locations, again, increasing your confidence that something is steatosis and not a neoplasm. I hope you've enjoyed part two of this three-part series on steatosis. Please like this video, subscribe if you enjoy the videos and find them informative, and I hope you'll join us for part three.